how it ends up impacting public policy and public opinion. Great, Daniel. Oh, that's close the door. Hello, hello. Okay, it works. How y'all doing? Notice how I slipped that y'all in just to get in the Texas picture. Okay, um, coal is always a very interesting topic and always is a very an emotional one, so it should be a very interesting um, lecture here. But let me start with a brief advertisement for the Electric Power Research Institute. We're really like a think tank for the power industry, but we are completely independent. A lot of people think we're kind of like a lapdog to the power industry. And while a lot of our funding comes from the power industry, we are a 501c3, so we are completely nonprofit and completely independent collaborative research. We have participants from all over, including six continents. We're working on Antarctica, but uh, it might take a while. I guess penguins do need power, so it's coming. Um, and we really study virtually everything associated with power, including obviously coal. So coal has a bit of an image problem. Um, and it, it, it certainly has a long history of both good and ill um, for human society. Um, I really like this picture down here where evidently Bigfoot and aliens have something to do with coal as well. But even in, in Texas, um, a very large coal power plant, Martin Lake, which uh, is owned by Luminant, which I've been to several times, has recently uh, been announced that it's going to be closed. And Luminant claimed it was because of economic reasons, but it's long been known to be a, a major polluter. And some claim it's the largest a producer of mercury of any power plant in the country. So there are a lot of positives and negatives around coal, but definitely right now coal has an image related problem. That said, it is still the fastest growing energy source in the world. That's right. Even though in the US people talk about coal dying, um, if you look at this, this rate of change here, coal is the fastest growing power source since 2000, and it's still virtually tied with uh, petroleum for world energy use. And the reason for that is largely because in Asia and China and India, the amount of coal power that's been built in the last 10 years has been phenomenal. And if you look at this graph here at the bottom, you can see that Asia was, you know, fairly small in coal and it has just astronomically gone up to the point where um, Asia uses twice as much coal as the rest of the world combined. So, you know, in the, in the desire to um, improve standard of living and all the economic benefits associated with power and the fact that both India and China have large coal reserves, they have put a lot of bets on coal. So right now, coal is growing substantially. In fact, who knows um, where Texas ranks in terms of coal use or coal power use in the United States in terms of states? Anyone have a guess? Yes. Actually, number three. Coal, Texas is number one in power production, but 40% of the power in Texas is produced from coal, which is a very large number. So there's about 400,000 gigawatt hours uh, I believe of coal a year, about 150,000 of that is from, from coal. Um, so it's a very large percentage. And if all that coal went away, you'd basically be shutting down all the power in Houston and Dallas combined. And I know here in Austin, maybe that would be something favorable, but um, the, the country, this country and the rest of the world still relies very heavily on power from coal. 
That said, in the U.S., several factors have combined to uh, make coal shrink. Um, the first is the phenomenal increase in the availability of natural gas from shale gas reserves and driving the price of natural gas down. Natural gas has had a long history of, of extreme variability in its pricing, which has always made it a hard fuel to uh, bank on for power producers, particularly in this country, but in the last five to ten years, the, the prices have dropped and been fairly stable at low amounts, low enough that new, coal, uh, no, new power plants in the U.S. are largely being built on gas. On top of that, the uh, EPA has a, a new set of regulations which are um, still being vetted through that would require all new coal power plants in this country to meet a CO2 led, uh, regulation of 1,000 pounds CO2 per megawatt hour. As of right now, not one coal pole power plant out there can attain this. It's actually equivalent to the amount of CO2 that's produced from a, a typical natural gas plant, which produces about half the amount of CO2 that, that coal does. So basically, that's saying that if you're going to build new coal in this country, um, you have to do some, for, some form of capturing of the CO2 or have an extremely efficient plant that, no, that does not e exist at this point. Okay? So if you look at these two factors, coal use in this country is definitely declining. In fact, this summer, exporting of coal from this country was at its largest amount in the history of this country. In fact, um, coal now in Europe... 25% of the coal used in Europe, which traditionally came either locally from the UK or from uh, South America, is now coming from the United States of America. So coal is diminishing in this country as of right now. Similarly, in Europe, even though coal generation has increased here in the past year for a variety of factors, it is continuing to decline because there's a lot of um, government funding related to renewables, so Europe tends to be a little bit ahead in renewables compared to the rest of the world. And electricity demand is, is really falling in most countries in Europe. Population is declining in some. So there's not really any new power needed. And if there's new power needed, they largely would not go with coal, um, particularly because the environmental regulations in most spots in Europe are very strong, maybe even stronger than the United States. So when you look at all that, and here's where you have an engineer that has some fun with animation, Coal power is shrinking in the West. And actually, I calculated that to see, so it would exactly show you how much it was, it's projected to shrink in the next 20 years. It's pretty nerdy, I know. Okay. So I, the whole issue of coal is extremely complex because there are lots of pros and cons. On the positive side, it really represents energy security for many parts of the world. And energy security is really economic security. So in China, India, United States, some places in, in Europe, there are a lot of coal reserves. So it's cheaper and easier to use coal in those areas. In most places, uh, natural gas prices are quite high. Um, renewables, nuclear are quite high. And coal is far and away the cheapest form of power. So um, unlike the U.S., fuel cost is generally lower for coal elsewhere. And coal has been around for a long time. So a lot of the infrastructure has been put together for coal, um, transportation needs. It's very safe to transport coal. You're not going to see a, a gas explosion. You're not going to see oil dumped in the sea with coal. Coal is very stable and easy to store. And it's also dispatchable, unlike renewables that are intermittent. Coal obviously stores a lot of energy. So when you flip on your light switch, you get the power that you demand because it can store energy. So there are a lot of pros associated with coal. On the negative side, it's, it's pretty dirty. Um, it's far and away, um, environmentally, the least friendly uh, fuel. Um, ash, it produces large volumes of, of byproducts from ash. And if ash has... Um, hazardous air pollutants like mercury in it, um, that can be a problem. Um, the, the other emissions, uh, the criteria emissions of mercury, criteria meaning they're regulated in this country as pollutants of mercury, NOx, particulate matter, and SOx are all quite high for coal, higher than any other fuel. 
Um, the efficiency, because coal has a lot of water in it, um, it's, the power plants are less efficient than natural gas plants, which is another strike against it compared to natural gas. And then the big one, which is more recent, is related to CO2 and the threat of climate change. And coal is far and away the largest producer of CO2 of any type of power. Only fossil, fossil power produces CO2, nuclear renewables, water, what have you, will not. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, coal produces twice as much CO2 uh, on an equal basis as natural gas. So it's, it's a complex question. There's a lot of give and take. And that makes it a very emotional issue around the technical issues and challenges associated with coal. So I went to Berkeley, you know, so I'm pro-green and, you know, I got into the coal business a long time ago, mainly because I wanted to try and help make it better. Um, I think most of the coal that's out there is likely going to get burnt, so we might as well try and burn it in the right way. So here are some keys to try and do that. Um, the first is uh, use as, as little as we can and get more out of it, so improve the efficiency. Continue to clean up its act, not only related to the criterion emissions, but also related to CO2, where if you can capture and store or utilize the CO2 safely so that it doesn't go up into the atmosphere, that will be a huge uh, benefit for coal. And then coal has been fairly stable in the way it's been burnt over the last 80 plus years, but there are some new power processes out there which are more transformative, this is a word that the Department of Energy has used that could really change the paradigm, I use paradigm, first time, uh, of coal power going forward. And then there are some different ways of using fuel in general or power in general that can re reinvent itself so that you can uh, be more efficient and improve your environmental performance. So I'll talk about each of these. So let's start with efficient, efficiency first. Efficiency has never really been a big deal for coal power in this country, largely because you, the consumer, pay for the coal. It's a pass-through to the people that buy the power. So there really hasn't been a huge advantage for uh, utilities to improve their efficiency because fuel costs really has not meant a lot to them. However, when you improve efficiency, a lot of other beneficial things happen. And the current fleet of coal power in this country that was built in the 70s generally is around 538 degrees C for steam temperature. If you're able to go to a higher temperature, you can improve the uh, efficiency by about nine points. So working off of that, when you do that, you use about 22% less coal. So if coal is a problem and you use less of it to produce more megawatts, all the better. And around that, um, you get about 21% less emissions and ash, so less SOx, less NOx, less CO2 uh, for this 9% improvement in efficiency. And then another very important factor which will continue to grow and might likely be the most important factor at some point is water consumption. Power plants use a lot of water Water is a very precious commodity. When you improve the efficiency, you use less water. And then you throw in the bonus that because you're, you're using less fuel, all the equipment can be smaller, so your capital costs are less. There's a lot of drivers towards improving efficiency for coal power plants today. So here's a plot that shows um, efficiency versus temperature. And this is physics 101, Carnot cycle, as you improve the, uh, efficient, the temperature, your efficiency goes up. So as I mentioned, most of the older fleet in the U.S. is around a 32% uh, net efficiency on a higher heating value basis, and it's about 538C. If you're able to go up to the 600, 620C, which is the new ultra supercritical, like the Turk plant that was built by AAP recently, and like plants that are built, being built now in Europe, uh, you get about that 8 to 9% improvement in efficiency, and at the same time, as mentioned, you reduce your CO2 output. Um, theoretically, you could go higher, but the limit has always been material strength. 
you get higher in temperature, you can have materials uh, be destroyed, which is obviously a bad thing for many reasons. But there have been some advances recently in nickel alloys that allow higher temperatures. This uh, <coughs> Inconel 740, which EPRI has done a lot of work on with the Department of Energy and the Ohio Coal Development Office, um, this plot shows, as a function of temperature, the stress that is allowed by the material. So you see some of the materials simply cannot go above a certain temperature. But this shows you that for 700 degrees C, this is the thickness of these materials that you'd have to use. Obviously, the thicker it is, the more expensive it is to the point where you can't even use it. This Inconel is very strong even at high temperatures and has actually been approved by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers up to 800 degrees C. So that means that you can, at least in theory, go to higher temperatures and improve the efficiency of coal plants. Okay, let's talk a little bit about emissions. So um, as I mentioned, coal really is dirty. I mean, it is a, a chemical soup of, of virtually everything that you can get because it's, it's basically been compressed, swamped, you know, with dinosaurs and everything in it over years. So it's got a little bit of everything in it. Um, it's also solid fuel. So when you burn solid fuel, it's harder to burn than liquid or gas fuel. And it has a non-combustible amount in it called ash, which is uh, something that comes out generally at very small size, which can be a major problem. So, of all of the criteria emittance, the sulfur dioxide coal has, can have a lot of sulfur in it, and almost all of that is converted to SO2. SO2 is a renowned acid gas, or a, 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 a acid gas. So SO2 is, is bad and has uh, been principally involved in deforestation. It's a large producer of NOx. Uh, NOx can be produced both thermally by uh, the nitrogen that's in the air, but also coal has a lot of nitrogen in it, which very easily gets converted into NOx. NOx is also involved in acid rain, but it's also a, a lead producer of smog, which as you all know is a lung irritant. I was in Houston this morning, I looked over the city and it looked completely smoggy. You could barely even see the buildings. Mercury is a new, a fairly recent uh, regulated emission from coal. Um, we know it's toxic, so it's a big deal. Interestingly, it's not regulated anywhere else yet, just in the United States. Carbon dioxide, we already talked about. What's not on here is particulate matter, which is the ash that's ground up along with any unburnt carbon that comes out. And this is a fairly nasty carcinogen, which can cause lung cancer. So um, there's just a lot of potential bad news associated with emissions from coal, and they produce a wide amount of these criteria pollutants. However, um, there has been a phenomenal amount of success in improving coal power over the years. Since the inception of coal power in the 1920s, there have been phases of new technology that has come out that's done an incredible job at reducing emissions. So from the beginning to where most of the current fleet that's being installed, there's been a 99% reduction in, in sulfur dioxides. There's been a 93% reduction in NOx because of the efficiency improvements, lower CO2. Um, similarly, particulate matter has also been reduced, um, as has, there, there's not a lot of data on mercury, but mercury can also be reduced as well. So there's been a lot of progression in coal. It's not like people have just been sitting around saying, you know, we, we can't make this better and we won't make this better. There's been a lot of progress. Where has that progress come from? Largely from improvements in environmental control devices for mercury. So I've broken this into the two principal ways of using coal, either by pulverizing it, either to very fine powder form and then blowing it into a, a boiler to be burned, or you can grind it into briquettes and fluidize it and burn it in a bed. Or you can gasify it. So you use air or oxygen to turn it into something that's called synthetic gas, which is largely carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and you can burn that gas. So there are different technologies for knocking out emissions for those two styles of burning coal. 
for pulverized coal and gasification, there's this activated carbon, which is a, like a pellet that you can shoot into um, the flue gas, and it absorbs the mercury in it, and then it, you can collect it the same way you collect particulate matter. For NOx, um, to attack thermal NOx, so the NOx is formed at higher temperatures. The higher temperature, typically the more NOx you produce. There's been a lot of work in reducing the temperatures at which combustion occur in the burner by better mixing. Those are low NOx burners. On the gasification side, water is used to reduce the temperatures to reduce thermal NOx. But also on the back end, you can use catalytic reduction. So use a catalyst that you pump the flue gas through, which uses ammonia or urea to convert the NOx back to nitrogen. So doing this, you can knock almost all of the NOx out and all the SOx out. For the particulate matter, there's been some very good devices that have been in place for a long time. One is a filter-based device, a bag house. The other is electrostatic precipitator. It's a very interesting device where you put an electric charge in the flue glass stream, you ionize the ash, to a positive charge, and then you have a plate that's in a negative charge, opposites attract, um, it comes to a plate, and then you flip it. And these devices are very good at taking out um, particulate matter, and for gasification, it's a bit easier. You can do it with water scrubbing or filters. And then on the SOX side, and Gary Rochelle was here saying that he is a big leader in this. One of the big uh, environmental improvements in this country, if not the world, related to coal was um, this installation of flue gas desulfurization, where you use limestone or a calcium scrubber, so you bubble the uh, flue gas through a calcium mixture and you turn the, um, the sulfur into calcium sulfate or gypsum if you want, so you can take it out as solids fairly easily. It's been very effective. Um, on the SOX side, or on the uh, gasification side, it's a little bit different because generally you don't produce sulfur uh, dioxide, you produce H2S, which then can be knocked out um, using acid gas removal, so it's a chemical solvent. So long story short, you can already achieve near zero emissions with coal right now. Unfortunately, most of the power plants out in the world do not have all of these devices on them, and the cost of putting them on would be extreme. So that is a problem, and that's why coal is still a problem. Right? So flipping to CCS, um, which is really one of the areas that I focus on, so I have a lot of material on this. The climate change debate goes on. I just read an article about Fox News getting in trouble because they're supposedly 97% of the scientists agree that climate change is, is uh, happening and it's caused by anthropogenic or, or human-made uh, greenhouse gases. Um, but Fox News talks to only the 3% that don't believe in it, so kind of on the opposite end. But there's definitely a debate, and there's been missteps on the scientific side related to proving that global warming is real, and you can see some of the energy. Actually, both sides now use polar bears. Now on the, it's a hoax, they, they are showing polar bears jumping from ice to ice because this guy, evidently there were a bunch of... Uh, icebergs around him, so there was a lot of blame on that. So I really see this right now as less of a technical issue and more of an emotional issue because nothing is going to be done associated with this issue, whether it's, it's actual or not, unless you, the public, get behind it. So it's really an emotional issue, and, and my opinion for what it's worth is, is while it's, I've done a lot of work on, on looking at the science associated with the potential for global warming, and, and to be brutally honest, I think some of it is inconclusive, I'm not willing to take the risk that it's not. So even at the minimum of insurance policy, I want to work on ways to try and prevent this from potentially happening, because if it does happen, it will be a huge disaster for all life forms on this planet. So that's why we're working on it, even if it's something that, and actually to be honest, um, a lot of the projections said that if there were a four degree rise in, in the uh, temperature in the atmosphere, then we were already past the point of no return. It's already happened, um, and while we're seeing some in, impacts of 
of climate change, with more weather and stuff. You know, obviously, we're not seeing sea levels rising tens of feet like has been predicted. So there's definitely some time left to do something and learn more about this. And we intend to try and capitalize it. So what is a CCS? CCS stands for actually multiple things, either CO2 capture and storage, carbon capture and storage, CO2 capture and sequestration, or carbon capture and sequestration. It's used in all forms, but it's, it's seen by many, but not all, as the principal way to tackle the issue of CO2 produced, not just from coal, from fossil fuels. Really, what fossil fuels are doing is they're digging the carbon up out of the ground in some way or other, converting the CO2 and putting it up in the air. So the only thing that we can really do to prevent that from happening is either never dig it up, or if we dig it up, put it back. So you can do all the efficiency improvements and all that stuff, but invariably, if you're going to use all of the hydrocarbons and burn it and turn it into CO2, they're all going to go up in the atmosphere at some point either way. So if you're going to continue to use them, you have to figure out a way to keep them here and not let them go up there. So carbon capture and storage is one of them. And capture, it means removing the CO2 at the place where it's produced, and then potentially transporting it, typically by pipeline, to a place where you can store it. And then storage is generally done in a variety of different ways, generally way down like a mile under the ground, either in a, in a saline reservoir or in some cases, if you can use it for something useful, so you can actually get some economics out of it as well, like enhancing oil that would have been recovered at any rate, but you can do it more cost effectively, or gas as well, and then leave the CO2 stored there after you've, you've used it to help with the recovery, then that's storage. So this is a, a big subject. There are other concepts, as I said, but I think that this is the most viable and the closest reality. It does have a long ways to go, even so. So some of the principal questions about it are, can it be done? So I'm involved in the, in the three largest carbon capture and storage projects in the world right now. Um, and I've seen it work. Yester, uh, two days ago, I was in Alabama at a plant where they're, and I'll talk about that here in a second, where they're capturing the CO2. And I was at where it's being stuck down in the ground. So from a capture point of view, it can be done. Not only can it be done, it is being done. Storage is another question, because really, the ultimate answer on whether storage will work takes time, a long time, because it's got to stay down there, well, pretty much forever, right? So storage has been going on for a while, and in some places at large sizes, but you really need a long time to understand what the CO2 is doing on the ground and make sure that it's really safe and secure. And that's a big thing around this, not under my backyard. It's a huge issue in, in, Aust in uh, Australia and Europe where uh, the, the population is very anti having CO2 either stored under their property or transported through their property because of the concerns that if the CO2 comes up that you know, obviously they're going to be poisoned and, and die from the CO2. Um, so is it safe is still something that needs to be answered. Is it too expensive? Unequivocally, yes. Right now, the energy penalty for most CO2 capture systems and with the storage component is about 30%. So basically, you're taking a power plant, 1,000 megawatts, knocking it down to 700 megawatts. So it's a huge penalty, and that doesn't even count the capital cost side. And is there anything else that we didn't think of? There might be, and that's why we're doing testing at scale at mul multiple places at a variety of different sizes. This is a neat uh, schematic that actually was given to my friend, by my friends from Total, which is a gas company in France. And this is one of the loveliest places in the French Alps, right under a vineyard, where they're transporting the CO2 and sticking it in the ground. This pipe here is exactly four inches in diameter. You can't even see it. It's very tiny. So um, as I said, it is being done, but there's still a lot of concern from the public about whether it can be done and be done safely. So really, um, I think the lowering of CO2 is a two-step process. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there right now to do efficiency improvements to reduce CO2 production right now. And public doesn't have any concerns associated with that because it's safe, 
You don't have to have CO2 stored anywhere. But you can only get part of the way there. You're limited by physics, material strength. So about one third of the CO2 that most people say need to be captured to prevent potential global warming, and there's definitely a gray area in how much CO2 needs to be captured and how much the temperature can rise in the atmosphere before we get into trouble. But most people claim or, or think, including EPRI, that eventually all fossil powered um, plants have to capture 90% of their CO2. You cannot cap get rid of 90% of the CO2 production just from efficiency. You really need to capture it and store it. Okay, so it is a two-step process, though, because we can get a lot of bang for a buck right now on efficiency while we continue to vet and improve carbon capture and storage or some other method. So right now, there are three different ways to capture CO2 from coal, and it's important because they have intrinsic differences. Um, they are broken down a bit by how you produce coal power. So the traditional way that we're most familiar with is pulverized coal, as I mentioned, where you burn it in a boiler. Um, also, fluidized bed combustion, where you have these chunks that get blown through air, so they're kind of a moving bed, and you can burn coal in this bed. Um, these are what we call combustion-based uh, uh, coal power. And in these cases, you take the CO2 out after you burned it, so post-combustion. You take it out of the flue stream, which is largely nitrogen, because nitrogen, there's a lot of air that you use when you burn coal. There's a lot of nitrogen, so you have to take the CO2 out from a heavy nitrogen stream. Typically, this is done using a solvent, a chemical solvent, which reacts, generally a hydrocarbon amine family, that reacts with the CO2 to capture it, take it out, and then you can release the CO2 from this amine at pressure and at temperature, and that's where the energy penalty really comes in and then it circulates and you continue to clean it out. This definitely works, it can be done, but it's, it's, it's definitely expensive. On the uh, pre-combustion side, or, or on the gasification side, you actually take the CO2 out before you burn it. So when you do gasification, you either use air, typically pure oxygen, and you gasify the coal at pressure and that produces syngas, which as I mentioned is largely carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Hydrogen is great, that's great fuel to burn. The CO is very easy to shift into carbon dioxide with uh, water. So you can convert the CO into water, and then it's, or the CO into CO2 using water. And then it's fairly easy to take out using, again, a solvent type process. But it's done at pressure. So that means that it's done more effectively, and the CO2 that comes out is already at pressure because in all of these cases, if you're gonna store it under the ground, you have to store it as a liquid, which means you have to pressurize it up to about 2,000 pounds per square inch, which is another big energy penalty that you have to pay for carbon capture and storage. A third method, which uh, is fairly immature, hasn't done um, other than at about 30 megawatts, is called oxycombustion. In this case, you take the nitrogen out of the air. You separate it, typically cryogenically, using refrigeration, and then you burn in pure oxygen. Well, actually, you recircle, circulate in some of the flue gas to keep the temperatures low enough so that you don't run into material problems. But the flue gas you get out is largely carbon dioxide and water. So engineers are very good at taking water out of streams. It's very easy to do. So the cleanup is much cheaper from an energy point of view, as well as from a capital point of view. So this is something which a lot of people are very interested in because people think it might be the most cost effective. The problem with oxycombustion, though, is unlike these two, you can't do partial capture. So if you wanted to capture 60% of the CO2, you could do it with either of these. If you want to capture 90%, you can do it with either of these. For oxycombustion, it's either all or nothing because you're paying a huge price to take the nitrogen out of the air up, up front. And then if you pay that huge price and you only take part of the CO2 out, you're really defeating the purpose of the entire thing. So it's one of those things that you're only going to do if there's a real need and an economic reward for taking CO2 out. So it's one of those things which, while I think it has um, quite a potential future, it's gonna be more out there until there's some economics around taking CO2 out. 
So all of these things need to be tested at scale. We've done bench scale tests, so fairly small. We've done laboratory tests, the next step up. We're now testing at partial slipstream size, so a small fraction of the entire thing. And each of those steps, we've learned something new. You don't want to learn everything at full scale because it can be dangerous and it can waste you a lot of money. So generally with R&D, you progress slowly, scaling up as you go along. We haven't done any major CCS demonstrations yet, and unfortunately the economy and the recession happened five or six years ago, really wrecked a lot of the funding mechanisms associated with CCS demonstrations. So this list back in 2007 when I started at EPRI, I have 10 minutes, I'm almost done, um, would have been uh, much larger. So let me go through some of these. As I mentioned, I was at Plant Berry. This is the largest post-combustion capture site. Um, and I guess the, the key thing here is, is it works. It absolutely has proven that it can capture 90% of the CO2 at 99% purity and stick it in the ground with no problems. A little bit of a blow up here. See a little bit more. So this is the absorption where the CO2 is actually taken out of the flue gas. And this is where that solvent, the amine, and the CO2 mixture where at uh, temperature you separate it and then the CO2 gets compressed and stuck down in the ground and goes out, and then the amine circulates back. So this is about the size of a football field for 25 megawatts. So these things are going to be gigantic. So that's another potential issue with them. Boundary Dam is a project in Canada, which is the one of two commercial-sized actual operating plants that are being built in the world with CCS. Um, it's going to be about 110 megawatts and store about a million tons of CO2 annually, and it's going to use it for enhanced oil recovery. So they're getting some economic benefit from doing that. They have a process that they claim lowers the energy penalty. We'll see. That's really true. And with all of these projects, we're talking about billions of dollars of public funding or ratepayer funding to be able to afford the added cost of uh, installing these uh, devices. And here's a blow up. So quite a bit larger than the other one. This is the absorber tower. They actually do some sulfur removal up front of this. The uh, amines that are used for the solvents for the CO2 do not like sulfur, so you generally have to take more sulfur out going into them. This is the stripper, and since this is in the middle of nowhere in very cold Canada, everything has to be covered because of the weather. But this is purported to be online early next year, so it's a big deal. Here's the Texas Clean Energy Project built in the great city of Midland, Texas. This is going to be an IGCC with CCS, a little bit different because it co-produces fertilizer at the same time. So you take the coal in with oxygen, you gasify it, then out of that you produce power. You also convert some of the uh, hydrogen and the nitrogen into ammonia, urea, you sell that fertilizer, and then they're gonna use the CO2 for ER. So they have three revenue streams coming out of this that are at fixed price, long-term offtake agreements. So a little bit different way of doing things. FutureGen is a large-scale oxycombustion site, which is going on in Illinois. It has not re reached financial closure yet. It looks very good. It's again about 100, um, 100 uh, megawatts in size and about a million tons per year and you can see the big uh, penalty that you pay associated with CCS in terms of an efficiency ding. So I'm very bullish on this project. I hope it goes forward because it's the only one in the world that doesn't use enhanced oil recovery. It uses pure sequestration. So hopefully this one will go forward. Just in case you think monitoring and storage does not have a lot of public concern, they're going to require 50 years of monitoring activities for this project. It's been deemed a class six well by the EPA, so there's a lot of work and back-end costs associated with monitoring what happens to the CO2 once it goes under the ground. So just to sum up on CCS, here's the cost. Levelized cost of electricity is a mixture of capital and operating costs. Give you a true cost of what a power plant costs. For coal without CCS, when you go to 90% capture, you almost double the cost. 
So you can see that you pay a big price for doing that. So if there's no economic reward for CO2, no one's going to do it. If you did partial capture, like what the EPA is going to regulate, you're still paying a fairly large penalty. If you look at where natural gas is in this country right now at three to six dollars per million BTU, you can see why even now without CCS, coal is not always being dispatched because the price of gas is so low in this country, it's not competitive. Okay? So a couple of quick things. If this price should go up, as it is in other places in the world or variability in the United States, then coal might have more of a play, particularly with CCS. Or if you can get some economic value out of the CO2 that you take out so that you knock some of this co cost down, then CCS might have more of a future sooner rather than later. And there's obviously a lot of R&D going on on reducing this cost here. So there's a lot of work going on on more advanced cycles. Um, and I think there is definitely a future for them. I'm going to highlight a couple of them here because I think that they're interesting. They're ones that I'm involved in. One is called chemical looping combustion. And really, it's oxy combustion without paying the price that you pay for separating the nitrogen out of the air using cryogenics. When you do that, there's a huge energy penalty associated with it. With chemical looping combustion, instead, you use a metal, a copper, an iron, a bunch of others that looked at to oxidize the air. So air comes in into this moving, looks like a fluidized bed. The metal oxidizes at temperature and carries the oxygen into a fuel reactor where fuel comes in and then does a reducing reaction where it takes the oxygen from the metal, produces heat, carbon dioxide and water, and then that leaves. So basically you've got a very effective oxy combustion system without the penalty you pay for producing the pure oxygen. Very, it's still at 100 kW size. It's got a long ways to go, but it's got a lot of potential because carbon capture is going to be cheap on it and the efficiencies are going to be much higher. The efficiencies I had on this were at the 42%, so more efficient than a coal plant right now without uh, carbon capture and storage. And then one other thing which people are really um, very interested in are these supercritical CO2 Brayton cycles. So CO2 has some thermodynamic properties which are superior to either air or water. It's less viscous, higher heat capacity, um, and higher density. So in this system, you use, again, oxycombustion. So you're using pure air. So you're paying the penalty to take the nitrogen out. And you're running a cycle that has supercritical CO2. So pressurized CO2, where you burn the oxygen and the fuel in here with CO2 at pressure that's brought in. You run this through an air, a, a gas turbine, and you produce very efficient power out of the gas turbine. And then you go through a heat exchanger to pick up the heat that's left. This is still at fairly high temperature. Then you take out the water and all the, the trace elements, and then you bring the CO2 back around and recycle it. The uh, efficiencies for this with CO2 capture are phenomenal, rated at 50%. It would be a revolutionary change in, in new coal power, but still more than a few years out. One other thing, a new paradigm is polygeneration, where you use fuels like coal and gas for more than just producing power. Um, and as we talked about with the Texas Clean Energy Project, Particularly when you gasify, you can produce a lot of other things, chemicals, fuels, solids. You can maybe use the CO2 for something effective. But afterwards, there's a lot of heat that's, you know, power plants are fairly inefficient. That efficiency is really heat that could be captured um, for heating and cooling or producing steam. So there's a way to take the fuel and get more out of it to improve your overall um, uh, energy efficiency and reduce your emissions because you're not doing this all standalone, you're doing it all together. And here's a very good example of this. Similar to the Texas Clean Energy Project, this is in California. The difference is, is that they are really maximizing their revenues by varying the products that they're producing. So if power prices are high and you can make a lot of money from power, they can produce more power. If fertilizer prices are high or power prices are low, they can produce more fertilizer. So they can vary their outputs to the market demand, make more money, 
And based on that, they improve their efficiency and their environmental performance. So this is a new spin on how to use coal power. Okay. So in summary, um, while coal is still dominant in power use right now, it's definitely under attack and for some very good reasons. It's growing in some areas and declining in others, largely around environmental related issues. While it's come a long way, it still has a ways to go. There's no question about that. But there are definitely some new technologies out there that are being worked on by many that can help. On the CO2 side, if reductions are required, um, incentives will absolutely have to be put in place, at least in the short term, to prove the technology and help continue to reduce its cost. The costs are very high now. They're first-of-a-kind technologies. They will come down. But until then, if there's not an economic incentive, no power plant or utility in the world will put CCS on its plant because you're basically just doubling your cost for, for no value. So the cost has to come down and there needs to be support from the public to continue to do that. Um, otherwise, um, the only option really is not to use fossil fuels at all. And if you do that, the repercussions of how that could impact the economy and the ability to produce power in the short term could be substantial. So it's a balance between environmental demands and the quality of life that we all want from using power. Okay, that's it. I'll take questions from anyone except these two characters in the front row right here. Okay, question? Yes. You mentioned that um, pollution controls that are needed are extreme. Uh, I heard a speaker from a utility once say that they had a billion dollar power plant and it would cost them $900 million to put in the controls. Is that realistic? Is that extreme? It, it depends on what he or she was talking about in terms of the, the environmental controls that are put on. The more mature ones, like particulate matter, so like the bag house and the, the uh, electrostatic precipitators, are, are fairly cheap. Okay? So it wouldn't be commensurate to the cost of the overall power block, like what they were saying. If you're adding CO2 capture, it would be. You'd almost be doubling your capital costs, roughly. Okay? No other questions? That's it? Well, I'm, I don't want to force you to ask a question, but. So are you familiar with some of the proposed synergies for not necessarily coal, but. Um, I don't think that microphone's working, by the way. But. Yeah, it, it's, it's for the video. Oh, OK. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, you know, one, one of our uh, uh, experts here has suggested that in doing geothermal energy in the, in the saline aquifers along the Texas coast, um, those aquifers also contain methane, and in the recovery and return cycle for those, uh, one could use uh, the hot saline aquifers as a reservoir for uh, dissolving CO2 into the formation and recovering methane, and so you would have a geothermal plant and perhaps a much smaller gas plant operating side by side and, and gaining thermal efficiencies um, there. Yeah, we, we've done quite a bit of work at this hybrid concept of using fossil fuels, either coal or gas, with renewables. Um, one of the leaders, in addition to geothermal, would be solar. Um, the problem right now is, is that, particularly in this country, many of the utilities have used up their tax credits associated with renewables. So particularly the intermittent ones that are more expensive, like geothermal, well, geothermal is not as an intermittent, but solar in particular, um, it's pretty expensive to apply that. So there's less appetite right now for marrying that together with a mature fossil plant. But there are a lot of advantages. When you um, combine a solar plant, so thermal uh, solar, with a power plant, all the costs associated with solar 
go down because all the infrastructure is already there around the power plant, which can cost a lot of money. And then you can use the solar to produce the heat for carbon capture and storage, for example, and make everything better. So everyone's looking at that. Um, it's just right now, at least for CO2 capture, without any reward for capturing the CO2, people are really struggling with doing that more than at the pilot scale size. Okay? But, I mean, we've looked at... Ge geothermal has its own issues as well. They all do. But certainly people are looking at geothermal and solar, uh, marrying it together with, with fossil plants. Yes? So what are your estimates as far as what, say, a carbon tax would have to be, how much to make it economic? I, you could do some math, but I'm not sure it would translate. If you double it, yeah. 60 to 120, is it about 60? I, I think people are, I mean, there are all kinds of numbers associated with that, but uh, I think $80 per ton in this country is what people are looking at that would be something that would make uh, coal plants economical or competitive with natural gas. It'll be different depending on where you're at, of course. And then if you had $80 a ton, um, what would that do to the price of gasoline? What would that do to the price of gasoline? Yeah. $0.80? Cent? $0.80? Cent? Did he answer it for you? Okay. $0.80, cents, I think he said. I'm glad Gary answered that because I would have been guessing. I'm curious what your opinion is on if you think that maybe a supercritical plant like the plant in uh, Morgantown or the plant in Arkansas are going to be kind of the stepping stones between the plants that we have in operation to carbon capture, if they'll be the beginning or if you think there's any correlation? <clears throat> well, the problem right now in this country is no one, let me repeat, no one is planning on building a new coal power plant, period because of the EPA regulations that are being proposed. So whether it be 600, even up to 700 degrees C, no one has any plans for that other than the ones that are already in place that can be grandfathered in. Now in other places, particularly in China, they're definitely looking at going to higher temperatures. And then there's a project in India which will go to 700 degrees C. And that's definitely a stepping stone, like I said, that if you can do the low-hanging fruit of reducing efficiency so that you reduce the CO2 production to begin with, not only are you knocking CO2 out, but the CO2 capture that you need to put on to get the rest of it is smaller and cheaper. Okay? So that's a very good point. Okay. So the, uh, the EPA regulations are for new coal-fired power plants? That's correct. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that there's we've got to act pretty much to, to uh, create change and, and uh, you know, bring down CO2 emissions. So what do you think, you know, what are your uh, thoughts on how to, how to reduce that with the current emission? I mean, I know the administration has said that they're going to do something at, about it and look at it, but, uh, you know, from your perspective, what do you see as kind of the, the uh, quickest, quickest way to... to um, well, l l let, me, let me answer that in a different way. Um, it doesn't matter, frankly, what happens in this country related to CO2. Um, we could shut every coal plant down and every natural gas plant down right now, and CO2 will still continue to grow um, production because of what's going on in China and India. Okay? So um, whatever needs to be done, so that's where CO2 is a little bit different than the other environmental issues. The other environmental issues can be somewhat local, whereas CO2 is a world phenomenon. So it's great that um, certain regions are attacking it in different ways and others can learn from that, but ultimately you're going to have to attack the CO2 production where it's the largest now, which is primarily in China. So what's interesting is, is that 10 years ago, people were saying, well, you know, China and India, the, the, the West is a very Eurocentric point of view, but the West was going to lead in R&D, and then we'd bring China and India along 
with us. Well, it's actually flipped a little bit. China is doing more related to carbon capture and storage and advanced material research than is happening in the West. They have more CCS demonstrations at scale, more CO2 capture, R&D work going on, at least as far as we can tell, um, than what's going on in Europe or the United States. A, because they're burning a lot of coal and, and they are very worried about the problem too and they've committed in their 12-year in their, uh, in their plan, their latest 12-year plan, to reduce their, their carbon intensity by 40% by 2020, which is a big deal. But not only that, they want to produce the technology that's going to be bought by the rest of the world. So they have the money to advance it. They, have, they can do, advance it faster because re regulatory concerns are less in China. You know, liability associated with storing CO2. You can move faster. So they are really taking advantage of that to try and advance the technology there. And they have to because, you know, ultimately, if CO2 get, does get proven to be a problem, it's not like you're going to shut off every coal power plant in China. You can't. I mean, they, they have to have power too. So I think a lot will happen in this country. I think existing plants for now are going to be left to their own volition. Most of them are quite old and they'll probably just be retired. Um, there will be a lot of uh, give and take on what happens with new coal. If natural gas prices go up to $10 per million BTU tomorrow, I can guarantee you the next administration that comes in place may not be as favorable on the EPA regulation on new coal. So, I mean, a lot still needs to be worked out in this country, and it's really a political, emotional discussion more than a technical discussion because, as I said, the CO2 problem really is elsewhere because while U.S. is part of the problem, it's not the biggest part of the problem. There was a long-winded answer to your very simple question. Uh, what are the differences in terms of environmental impacts between carbon sequestration and enhanced oil recovery? That's a very good question and one that we were having a singular debate on while we were standing on top of the largest uh, sequestration site in the world, which is in, in Alabama. So right now, the EPA regulations associated with CO2, the classifications around wells with CO2 stuck in the ground, have nothing to do with permanency of CO2. It all has to do with protecting drinking water. You don't want the CO2 that goes in the ground getting in the drinking water, so that defines the regulations around CO2 right now in terms of the EPA is concerned. At some point, you're going to have to prove that the CO2 that you've captured has been stored. Okay? So there are ways to do that, but the mechanisms between enhanced oil recovery and sequestration are different. Many people think that when you use the CO2, basically it's just cleaning out the coal or the gas and it's left behind in the now empty, which basically would be like a geological reservoir. Some of it does come out, but they do reclaim it at the top and then, then they pump it back down. Whether that's permanent or not, I don't know. The other argument is, are you, are you using that CO2 to produce a fossil fuel that you wouldn't have used anyway and then ultimately producing more CO2? That's another question that people are debating. But for now, Every CCS project of scale that's being thought of, other than the future gen one, has EOR only because you're getting 20 to $40 per ton for the CO2, and the economics are better right now. Him, let him, let's do him first. Well, it's, it's efficient. All right. Thank you. Um, my question is, what are the uh, good successful stories to solve uh, not, not in my backyard problems? Uh, any, any experience with that? And second, second question is about technology change. If you don't build new power plants here, what kind of impact will, will it will have on the technology change side? Okay, so let me get back to this. So the first one is I can give you what FutureGen did, which is 
Um, so FutureGen has a pipeline and a storage area um, that's, I can't remember, tens of miles away, almost 100 miles away. And for the landowners that the pipeline is running through, every single one of them gets a royalty for every ton of CO2 that goes through. They love it. So very similar to oil and gas, so they, they get royalties. In terms of the liability for what's underground, it is extremely complicated and not completely well thought out. It's a, it's a legal litigation type problem. For now, in this country, it's generally the liability falls on the state shoulders, not the federal level. Um, but that's not completely well vetted out in all 50 states. In other places in the world, it's a bit unknown other than China where liability issues are, are less of a legal problem. Um, you can get into all kinds of messy situations because a lot of coal power plants are on rivers. Rivers tend to be a boundary between states. So you can have something underneath that can spill in from one state to the other. Who's got liability? Um, it, it becomes a bit of a mess. But FutureGen really has been the model for right now because they were able to get uh, liability insurance at about a million dollars per year, which sounds like a lot, but it's really nothing in the economics of power production to cover up to $100 million in liability from their, their site, and then they have other backstops to that. Ultimately, I think doing this at scale to reduce the fears associated with it and continue to improve not only the, the um, there's a lot that needs to be done in characterizing where you store it, whether it's going to be safe, and then monitoring it when it's underground, and there's a lot of instrumentation around that. So the more that we do it, the more likely that that's going to get better. But every single project that happens has to be 100% flawless, because if there is a major leak, and it's not impossible that that could happen, then CCS is dead. Many people think that. Just like nuclear power is dead in many places because Fukushima, if we have a Fukushima type accident like that right now, CCS is, is likely dead, at least for the time being. Professor? I, I think we're actually out of questions. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm out of time. So let's thank Dr. Max. Oh, thank you.